And so in 1929, you had this massive intervention, and then that turned a sort of run-of-the-mill stock market crash into this horrible depression. What happened instead in 1919 is that, so they actually cut government spending and they actually raised interest rates. And that's fascinating because that's the exact opposite, of course, of what we do in modern recessions, what we've done really in every single recession since FDR did it. And what's fun is that both of those activities, it turns out, are exactly how to fix a recession. Both of those activities, they free up resources to go to new startups and new businesses, okay? So if you cut government spending, then the government is no longer competing with entrepreneurs for steel and manpower to rebuild racist overpasses. Now the entrepreneurs can have that to build factories instead, right? On the other hand, if we look at the interest rates, if you raise interest rates, well, the recession is happening in the first place because you had all this malinvestment because rates were too low, okay? And mm -hmm. so, you know, that all needs to clear out. If you raise rates, you actually accelerate the process. You wipe out all those crappy malinvestments, which means that now you have a bunch of workers and a bunch of offices and a bunch of empty factories that are just sitting there, super cheap, waiting for an entrepreneur to pick them up. And then in contrast, of course, when FDR did the opposite of that, they raised government spending and they lowered interest rates, well, we got the exact opposite. So government hogged up a greater share of productive resources. Meanwhile, a lifeline was thrown to those crappy malinvestments, basically telling them, keep it up, guys. Stay in business, you can keep hogging resources, you can keep starving the, uh, the new entrants, the entrepreneurs. If you enjoy this podcast and you want to learn more about Bitcoin, then make sure to subscribe to our free newsletter. Every Friday, we send out insights into macro, Bitcoin on-chain, and Bitcoin mining. Join over 100,000 existing subscribers by clicking the link in the description or going to newsletter.blockwareintelligence.com. This video is sponsored by Stamp Seed. You plan on holding your Bitcoin for decades, so you need to make sure that your seed phrase is documented in something that can last just as long. Stamp Seed's signature titanium plates and stamping kits do just that. If you simply write your Bitcoin seed phrase down on a piece of paper, it's vulnerable to fire, water, and all sorts of erosion that can happen over time. Make sure you keep it secure for years to come. Head to stampseed.com and use the code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% 15 off the entire website. You wouldn't walk down the street with a giant sign that has your home address on it. So why would you do the same on the internet? You need to use a VPN. Orca VPN is a service that encrypts your internet connection and hides your IP address, ensuring your online activities are private and secure. Orca VPN works on all different devices, Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, and Linux. Head to orcavpn.co and use the code BLOCKWARE and you can access Orca VPN for just $1.99 a month. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can ensure that all your internet activity is private and secure. Again, that's orcavpn.co, O-R-C-A-V-P-N dot C-O. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Blockware Podcast. I'm really proud to welcome Professor Peter St. Ange to the episode, an Austrian economist legend, uh, someone I wish I would have had as a professor in college. So I'm blessed to be able to talk to you and, and learn from you today. Thank you. That is a very flattering introduction. And uh, yeah, classes were actually fun. I, I, I miss being in the classroom, but you know, these days I would have to regurgitate a bunch of ideological garbage. So just as well that I'm not. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's a good place to start. You talk a lot about the eroding trust in institutions, specifically academia and, and mainstream media, these leftist run institutions. I want to know your thoughts on this idea. Like, why has the mainstream right not really fully embraced Bitcoin? Because they seem to distrust these institutions as well. So you would think that would carry over to banking, but they haven't seemed to really adopt Bitcoin uh, like, like guys like you or me. Yeah, I think it's funny. Um, you know, partly it's just kind of the broader dynamics of Bitcoin that younger people have trouble understand or older people have trouble understanding it. Um, there's a line by Max Planck, the physicist, uh, that science advances funeral by funeral. And it's a bit macabre, but there's a certain element to that where people don't so much discover Bitcoin as they sort of move on and then a new generation comes in who's more open-minded. But, you know, if you look at Bitcoin opinion or familiarity, 
uh, or fandom by age. I mean, it's really striking, you know, so anybody over the age of 60 who's kind of in our ideological space, like skeptical of mainstream, they're almost certainly going to be a gold bug. And then anybody under the age of like 30 is almost certainly going to be a Bitcoin. Uh, you almost never meet somebody in their 20s who's into gold. You almost never meet somebody in their 60s who's into Bitcoin. So I think some of that is just built in. You know, it's kind of a new thing. Uh, it is relatively difficult to understand. Um, I think a caveat on that is that, you know, fractional reserve banking is also really difficult to understand, uh, as is a credit card. You know, like if you actually mm -hmm. ask the average credit card user to explain exactly where the debits and credits are going, they haven't the slightest idea. Um, there was a professor uh, a couple of years ago, I want to say Wagner, out of Switzerland, and he's like a finance PhD, and, and he tried to figure out whether fractional reserve bankings are actually printing the money. And he, he like sat down with a local bank and he was like, okay, lend me some money and, you know, I'm just going to pay it right back to you. But here, lend it to me so that I can sit down with your people every step of the way and understand exactly how this money was created. The moral of the story being that, you know, we don't understand any of the stuff around us. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet people just accept them because everybody else accepts them. So, you know, when we talk about Bitcoin, I think sometimes the community gets a little bit sort of down on the idea that, you know, grandma's never truly going to grok, you know, the details, the, the, the difficulty adjustment and the, you know, the 21 million and whatnot, um, the second layer. But fundamentally, they don't have to. Right. There's some point where adoption becomes so widespread that, you know, why do people trust credit cards? You know, why do financially completely unsophisticated 19 year olds trust credit cards? Because they see other people using them. They see what the end result is. You pay the bill every month uh, mm -hmm. and that's good enough for them. So, you know, but in terms of why right now in this kind of adoption phase, you know, conservatism tends to correlate with age. You get married, you get a job, you start a family, you become conservative and age kind of works against Bitcoin. I think there's kind of a helping dynamic here, which is that conservatives I think sort of temperamentally tend to trust institutions that have been around a long time. That's usually a good idea, um, but it, I think a lot of them fail to understand that many of these institutions now have been so thoroughly captured by the left that you know the newspaper, uh, university professors, the science, quote unquote, these are not what you think they are. Yeah, that was really well said. And you're definitely right about, I have no idea how the fiat system works. My yeah, credit right. card just works. Like, <laughs> you know, the Bitcoin right. white paper is only nine pages long, but if you wrote a yeah. fiat white paper, I think that would be oh my a whole gosh. textbook. Yeah, exactly. Right. And we don't know how this Riverside program works, but we're still using that. On that idea, if people are using Bitcoin and they don't necessarily know the technicals, would you think that means they're not holding their own keys, which would make Bitcoin susceptible to rehypothecation, kind of how gold was? Uh, yeah, it's theoretically possible. I mean, generally, rehypothecation, if it's not contractually understood by the owner, then it's fundamentally fraud, sort of in a common law sense. And so a lot of the rehypothecation that does exist, for example, in fiat, is essentially cases of uh, buying special legal privileges, you know, lobbying Congress and whatnot to get um, special privileges that would not under a common law uh, system exist. So I, I don't think there's anything inherent to Bitcoin that argue or uh, really inherent to fiat even or gold, right? People talk about paper gold, but like there's nothing inherent to gold that, you know, sort of makes it liable to rehypothecation. And so I don't think that Bitcoin is necessarily automatically going to be rehypothecated. Um, I think one of the saving graces is that to the extent that we do have organizations in Bitcoin that centralize custody, I think there is a need for that just because a lot of people, they are dumb. Um, they make mistakes. You know, the, uh, the guy in Britain who threw away his hard drive with all the Bitcoin on it. Uh, these things do happen and they're not as reversible. Bitcoin is sort of less forgiving on that front. Um, so I do think that inevitably uh, 
a lot of the Bitcoin demand, maybe the overwhelming majority, is going to be custodial. What is a relief is that politicians are so unfriendly to the industry in general that, you know, it'll be a cold day in hell before Bitcoiners actually manage to bribe a Congress into allowing them to rehypothecate. Um, so I guess that saves us in the time being. Yeah, I definitely agree there. I want to start diving into macro and you've been, you put out some, you put out really good videos all the time. And one of your you. recent videos talking about the blockbuster GDP number, you know, GDP is rising. Yeah. All is sunshine and rainbows, allegedly, if you're looking at it. Can you tell us why that's not exactly the case? Yeah, in short, uh, so a big confusion is that GDP, people use GDP to represent wealth. Like if GDP is going up, then we're all getting richer. And of course, GDP is not wealth. GDP is activity. Okay, and there's a very, very big difference, right? So that activity could be digging holes and filling them back in, for example, which would be destroying wealth, right? Because that would be taking perfectly good shovels and perfectly good men and doing wasting them. Uh, so I think it, it, sort of broadly speaking, people want to differentiate between GDP and wealth. Now, governments tend to measure GDP because, of course, they would because they destroy wealth. They're very good at keeping people active, right, mm -hmm. throwing money at them, and especially if they have a central bank. Um, but they're very, very bad at, at, at creating wealth. In fact, you could argue that every single thing governments do uh, destroys wealth. And so if you focus on the, on the actual wealth of a society, then it would follow that you should make the government as small as humanly possible. Uh, on the other hand, if you're interested in activity, well, governments are very, very good at uh, activity. And so when we look at the GDP number at the moment, it is a quote unquote blockbuster. I think it came in at 4.2 or 4.9 or something. Anyway, a very high number uh, for the last quarter on GDP. And the thing is that once you dig into those numbers, it's a lot of activity is not wealth creation. So it is overwhelmingly fueled by deficit spending by governments, which is debt. That's borrowing from the future to waste it today. Uh, and then the other thing that's driving it is consumer debt. So consumers are spending more, but they're earning less. This is not sustainable. Again, at best, this is sucking for the future. Uh, but in the context where they're actually where incomes are actually going down, it starts to look a lot, a lot worse than that. So consumers are basically running through uh, their savings. There were trillions built up during the pandemic. So consumers have essentially run through that. I think the Fed estimated that as of October, so as of last month, those pandemic era savings are all gone. At this point, they're actually getting deeper into debt. That is going to bite us in the future. Yeah, 100%. This delineation between spending and wealth, I think it's super critical. Is there a way to actually measure wealth? What would you look at there, like manufacturing or, or what's that? Yeah, it's, it's actually uh, surprisingly easy to measure. Uh, the Fed does measure it. They have a, I think it's called the flow of funds. They have these, these, the, this mammoth um, compendium of statistics that they put out at least every quarter. And they go through, you know, what's the net uh, value, what are the financial assets, what are the households, they tally up all the homes, uh, the home equity. I mean, they, they, they have these statistics. It's, it's almost like um, a conspiracy where, you know, they produce GDP statistics, they, present, they uh, produce wealth statistics. So why is it that everybody focuses on the G GDP? Um, you know, we can speculate why media does that. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, they absolutely have it. And, you know, if we just kind of give a flavor. So in 2008, the 2008 crisis uh, is from memory. It was something like eight trillion dollars uh, that was evaporated in wealth. Pretty much every boom bust cycle, you just have this massive evaporation uh, in wealth. And they can absolutely track that, but they prefer to focus on the GDP. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Can you talk a little bit about the labor market? You put out a video recently talking about the different types of jobs that are being added. Can you dive into that? Yeah, so that was uh, the last job report came out and just kind of set the table. So the economy added about 150,000 jobs, which is a very low number for, you know, you got a population of 330 million odd. Uh, and so that was disappointing to, it was, it was disappointing to economists, but it was actually quite good for the market because uh, really the dominant thing in financial markets right now is whether the Fed's going to cut rates. And so, you know, the, the sicker the economy is, the better it is for markets, which is kind of weird. I think most people might imagine it'd be the opposite. 
Anyway, if you take that 150, it was a pretty lousy number, but a third of those jobs were government jobs. So, you know, if we're adding government workers, that is, it's certainly activity, but it's not wealth, right? A lot of those, at best, those workers are going to be paid to stare out the window. This is something I advocate, by the way. I want all government workers to just stay home. It's okay. We'll keep paying you. Don't worry about it. Just stay home. Stay out of the way. Uh, because at worst, a lot of those people, they're going to be paid a salary to actively hobble to burden the actual productive market, right? Like, mm -hmm. what's the cost of an EPA regulator, right? It's not their, you know, $120,000 salary. By the way, government workers make something like twice what their private sector uh, counterparts make. So, you know, we have a ruling class. It's called the government. But at any rate, I'm not worried about their 120,000 salary. I'm worried about the millions or potentially billions of dollars if they're good at their job, right? So I, I, I very much want bureaucrats who um, are paid to stay home. Uh, I really don't want to hire good bureaucrats, right? I would far prefer a million dollar cost EPA bureaucrat to a billion dollar superstar. So, right. So a third of them are government jobs. Almost the entirety of the rest, about 90,000 out of that 150 are either home health care or education. Education is basically a government worker. Mm -hmm. um, and so you put those two together, or actually you put those three together, and 140 out of 150 jobs created are people who are collecting checks. They're not actually producing anything for the economy. Uh, and then the final, you know, you had like 10,000 in there, and that was overwhelmingly leisure and hospitality. So we used to call those McJobs back when you were allowed to say bad things about the economy. Um, but meanwhile, if you look at the actual people who do produce things, so like manufacturing was down 35,000, trade, transportation, uh, IT, all these things are down, but the number of government workers and the, you know, between the education and the home health, uh, none of those are actually arguing for a stronger economy in the future. Yeah, 100%. So would you say that like, you know, despite the job numbers on the surface looking okay, GDP looking okay, all the technical measurements of a recession, we're not in one. But would you say that we sort of are? We're just like in a terrible state of the economy? Yeah, it's funny because we had a lot of weird stuff happen during the lockdowns. And one of those is that about 5 million workers pulled out of the labor force. They either retired early or they went on government benefits. During the, the COVID crisis, but anyway, I just call it the lockdowns. During the lockdowns, it was basically no questions asked on a whole bunch of government uh, benefits. And it, generally, in benefit studies, once somebody goes on government benefits, they stay on. Uh, it becomes sort of a poverty trap. And so anyway, we've had about 5 million Americans drop out. That juices the unemployment numbers because once they drop out of the labor market, they're not counted anymore. So if somebody is living on the street in L.A. and they're collecting free government money to, you know, fuel their lifestyle, they are not counted as unemployed. Sure, they're sitting in the park all day sleeping, but they're not unemployed. So when we look at the jobs numbers, I think that you want to take that with a big grain of salt. and You want to understand that the unemployment numbers are counting a very, very narrow set of people, which are people who don't have jobs and are actively looking for jobs. Right. If you actually look at the percent of Americans who are not working uh, and are unable to support themselves, like, you know, they're not living on savings, that number has skyrocketed. And really that that jobs number is the main thing that is keeping us out of recession at this point. If you look at essentially all the other leading indicators, uh, I think there's about 18 in total that the conference board puts out. And across the board, those are terrible um, the GDP number popped, yes, and that was fueled by debt. Um, we've also got a big boost because, you know, government deficits have really never been this high. Uh, they were for a minute there during COVID, but like in peacetime, when we're not having an existential crisis, they've never been this high. So the debt, the government deficit, which is, you know, of course, also debt, those are both driving, I think, the headline numbers. But beyond that, if you look at all of the other indicators, we are, we're either in recession. Uh, I mean, really, we would have been in recession for probably about a year now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What then if, 
if they can do the deficit spending to inflate GDP and then they can sort of manipulate the employment numbers by not including the people in the park, yep. what then will it take for the Fed to start cutting rates? Does it does the deficit have to get out of control because of the high treasury mm -hmm. yields or do asset prices <clears throat> have to tank? Yeah, I think most likely it's just that, um, you know, you're seeing companies fail. Bankruptcies are up, I think, about 30 percent on the year, which is it's not that epic yet. But as that goes up, you're going to have a lot more job losses. Generally, I think jobs are the thing that is going to scare the Fed straight. Uh, they're then going to turn around to flip rates. And once they do start cutting, they're going to cut as fast as possible. The trick for the Fed at the moment is that they are aware that inflation has not actually come down. Headline inflation came down, but that was largely energy. So Biden drained the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, you also had a bump when Putin first invaded Ukraine. That made people worried about energy because Russia is a big provider. Uh, so the edge came off of energy and that then sort of trickled down through the rest of the economy. But the core uh, inflation has it's really only eased, I think, about 0.7 or something. I mean, it's, it's, it's really barely budged. So the Fed is aware of that. They can see all those numbers. And so until core comes down, the Fed is not they're They're afraid to cut rates because they know that the single most important metric for how people assess the Fed is whether or not inflation is under control. And at the moment, they can see it isn't. And sort of the nightmare scenario for them is what happened in the 1970s, where you had this sort of camel back where inflation uh, went up really high early in the 70s. It came down for a couple of years. Everybody sounded the all clear. OK, woo, that's that's all done with. And then it took off again. And that second hump was much longer. In fact, it lasted for years. And that only ended when Paul Volcker engineered a really brutal series of recessions. The problem with that narrative, right? So if we are reliving the 70s, then we're due for this second hump that's going to be a lot bigger. What worries me there is that Washington, D.C. saw what happened to Paul Volcker, right? So Volcker was appointed by Jimmy Carter, shockingly. You know, Jimmy Carter is one of the most left-wing presidents, one of the most inflationary presidents. And yet he appointed Paul Volcker, who, you know, he jacked rates up to almost 20 percent. He really ended it. The thing is that Washington saw what happened next, which is that Jimmy Carter lost his job. So they're not going to make that same mistake a second time. They're not going to take one for the team so the president can fall on his sword so that, you know, the, 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 the world can be saved. They're just going to let the world burn next time. So that's what's concerning for me is that if it gets away from the Fed again, I don't see them pulling a Volcker out of their hat. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And so I guess, can you talk a little bit about stagflation then? Because that seems to be where we're headed. How bad is that? Because if you just talk to a Keynesian, stagflation couldn't exist because of the Phillips curve. If inflation's <laughs> going right. down, then right. uh, we can't have a recession. So can you talk about stagflation? Yeah, for the Keynesians, it's all in our head. Literally, Paul Krugman's been uh, pushing that line. It's all our imagination. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's exactly the concern. That's what we had in the 1970s was stagflation. The economy was not doing well. Uh, meanwhile, inflation was running rampant. And you would have thought that that would have buried the uh, Phillips curve, the, the sort of this, this Keynesian fantasy that, that there's this trade-off that you can just stomp on the accelerator and the brakes. You can keep the car going at the exact speed. And what the 70s showed us was that that is, that is not true. Uh, that inflation and economic growth are working on different things. Now, true, if you print a crap load of money and you do a bunch of spending, then you can get the GDP up. But that's very temporary. It's not sustainable. Uh, I thought it was Tom Woods who said it. He he actually denied it. So I guess I've, I've taken it in. Um, but the metaphor I like is a tissue fire, where if you do whether it's inflation or government spending, yes, you can get the economy to grow real fast, but it looks like a tissue fire. It burns, you know, very bright, but it burns very short. And so what happened in the 1970s was we discovered that, right? The 70s were 10 years long. That is much longer than any tissue fire. And so I think at this point, the Phillips curve is buried and done unless you happen to be an academic, an academic economist who's actually paid to spout this. I think what is concerning at the moment is that if we are coming into a stagflationary episode, which I think we are, 
Um, the two things driving it are going to be government spending, which appears to have no natural enemy. There's really no countervailing pressure on that. Um, they, I mean, except the crisis. So in other words, it'll uh, continue uh, until a crisis. And the other part of the 70s stagflation was really an explosion in government regulation. So Richard Nixon signed the uh, Environmental Protection Act. You had, I mean, it was really, it was a bipartisan deal. You had Johnson uh, with his great society, then you had Nixon, then you had Carter. It was just regulation after regulation. And all of those slow the economy, right? All of those gum up the works and get in the way of putting inputs, so people and resources, onto the most productive output. So that we are very much in the middle of, this Green New Deal, uh, the, the environmental, now the equity, those arguably trump uh, everything that happened in the 70s. So I think we're very much headed for stagflation. What is m different this time is that in the 70s, we didn't have nearly the kind of debt that we have today. So we had just come out of the uh, gold standard era. Wall Street was not nearly as top heavy as it was today. I grew up in the 80s and that was kind of the golden age of banking, right? Like if you wanted to be a big shot in the world, uh, you had to be a banker. And, you know, you can see all these movies from the 80s where, you know, the, the masters of the universe were these bankers. And that really, that really started, you know, it took years to build up after Nixon actually broke uh, the gold standard. So that's my concern at the moment is that I think all the ingredients are there for 1970s uh, stagflation. But then on top of that, we have this bank crisis. And we haven't really been here before, not in modern times. So we don't exactly know what happens when uh, that much debt meets a durable stagflation. Yeah. With this debt, to me, it seems like spend, like cutting spending, they won't do it, but it doesn't even seem like an option, right? right? Because you would have to rug pull the boomers on their social security and Medicare. So can you talk, is there any way for this to play out other than them for, for them to just inflate the debt away? I, I think it's still possible. Um, Clinton, I mean, it wasn't really Clinton. It was Gingrich managed it in the 1990s where you had a stalemate between the two parties and they couldn't agree to expand spending. And so we actually had, I think it was one or two years of budget surplus, which sounds like sci-fi today. Um, even with the entitlements getting more expensive, so Social Security, Medicare, you can still reform those. You know, you can cut rich people off Social Security. Uh, you could, you know, they have death panels to limit the costs in Medicare. I'm not endorsing that, but I'm saying they do have ways uh, to limit the costs. So I think it is theoretically possible, but what it would take is that kind of confrontational attitude in Washington. And, you know, if we look at how the rhinos are behaving, you know, they're, they're sort of more angry at Trump than they are at the Democrats. Um, mm -hmm. They very much act like the uniparty. And so I don't, I don't think we have any prospect of that in the near future. Yeah, I agree with that. Can we dive into Japan a little bit? Because I know you were yeah. just over there and you've <clears throat> talking about their economy a lot with the yield curve control. The yen is like collapsing against the dollar. Yeah. Can you explain exactly what's going on there? And when you call it a <clears throat> zombie economy, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so Japan has really for about 30 years now, they've had a slow growing economy and they haven't had stagflation. They've had stagnation with low inflation. Uh, and so I, I, I call that a zombie economy. A lot of people do. What it's basically made of is enormous quantities of government spending paired with very, very low interest rates. And so what that does is it feeds money to effectively large businesses. Large businesses are normally, excuse me, more uh, credit worthy than small businesses. So in low interest rates environment, uh, I mean, really, everybody can get money, but disproportionately, the larger companies tend to get it, especially in Japan, where loans tend to be more based on relationships. Uh, a lot of loans in Japan, they'll go to big businesses that are actually connected with the banks in question. So that's the Zaibatsu uh, setup. And so this, between the government spending and the low interest rates, You've had an enormous amount of Japanese resources, so manpower as well as physical resources, dedicated to companies that really aren't facing market tests. Right? These are either companies that are uh, 
Uh, you know, for example, they might be paving over rivers. This is a common practice in Japan because it's very expensive. So you can uh, get rid of a lot of taxpayer money. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can, uh, you know, give a lot of money to, to construction companies which absorb labor uh, and also make campaign donations. And then the low rates themselves have channeled a lot of money to large companies. So the end result is that the Japanese economy is it is starved of um, sort of startup funding. Uh, if you look at the turnover on the Japanese stock market, for example, so older companies being replaced by newer companies, it's much, much lower than it is in the U.S. on the S&P, for example. Uh, so Japan has really built this zombie economy for themselves. And what's happening at the moment is that there's this massive interest rate differential between Japan and the rest of the world. So Japanese rates are nearly zero. U.S. rates are five and a quarter or five and a half. So that has created, I think it's roughly six times more profitable to invest in U.S. bonds than it is in Japanese bonds. And so you have trillions of dollars now that are fleeing Japan and going overseas because Japan still has these extremely low rates while the Fed has these high rates. Now, in theory, Japan could raise their interest rates so that they could erode some of that gap between the two. But Japan's... Uh, they really can't do that for two reasons. One, their economy is already pretty weak. It's weak because all the capital has been going to all these crappy businesses. And so if they raise rates, and then they're afraid that they're going to tip the economy over into recession. And then the second reason is that they have taken on so much debt at this point. So it's something like 270% of GDP. In U.S. terms, that would be like having a $60 trillion national debt. Okay, so already paying 1% on that government debt, about a quarter of the government budget is going to debt service. But mm -hmm. if they were to bring rates up to 5% to try to match the U.S. to stop all the, all the yen from fleeing, then they would have to pay, what, 125% of government budget. Uh, the government's still got to do stuff. It's got to have a military, got to have highways, whatever. I mean, as a libertarian, you don't have to have these things. But realistically, yeah. in the near term, they will have these things. So they're, you know, you're talking, what, 200% on it, maybe. And, you know, the Japanese government already takes about a third of GDP. It, it, you, you cannot go that high. I mean, that, that would be putting you into near Soviet uh, territory. At some point, Atlas would very much shrug, and they wouldn't just lose their yen. They would lose their entire economy. Uh, every entrepreneur in Japan would leave and go start his business uh, somewhere else. So they are really stuck. They're stuck in this debt trap. And what's fascinating about Japan is that we are headed down the exact same path. And in some ways, I blame Japan because for a long time, there was kind of this, uh, there was an understanding among economists that once uh, national debt got too big, that it was going to be a problem, that it could create crisis. And that number was traditionally uh, estimated to be about 100 or 125 percent of GDP. Well, Japan blew past that. In fact, they crossed that about 25 years ago. And, you know, they've been slow, but I mean, they haven't collapsed. And so in a sense, I think that gave a false sense of security to some of these other countries where they then continued down that path. And, you know, it's worth noting that since Japan passed that 100 percent line 25 years ago, 14 other countries have defaulted on their sovereign debt. So, like, mm -hmm. it's not like you know, the world has changed and sovereign debt is acceptable now. It's that Japan is weird. And so, you know, I think that a lot of other countries will default a lot sooner. Uh, we saw this in Europe in 2009. So Greece um, default or they were threatening to default on their debt in 2009. The government ran on that as a platform. So it was a very real possibility. And Greece at that time, they were paying out less in debt service as a percent of GDP than the U.S. was at that time. Okay, so mm -hmm. they didn't have to default. Uh, they wanted to default. And I think there's a very important element where we're discussing the prospects of governments defaulting. You know, you could, in theory, run for president today on a default platform. You could tell Americans, look, I am going to make you a quick 30, what is it, $34 trillion. You don't have to do a thing. Just vote for me. Here's how much money is going to come at you. Now, that's not appealing to people yet, because voters don't think the debt, the debt is real. Okay, mm -hmm. they, they, they imagine some, somebody else will pay it. I don't know, maybe in the year 2,500, somebody will pay that debt. 
But, you know, like if you actually tell American voters like the debt is gone, you know, I, I don't know, it went what, 15 or something, 15 trillion or something since 2008 crisis. If you tell voters that if you break it down, how many is that, you know, per per uh, household? I think that's well over one hundred thousand dollars per household. Uh, and if you explain this to people, they go, eh, <laughs> you know, they're like, no, 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 you you understand. Somebody just took one hundred thousand dollars. You. You're going to have to pay that with interest. And they don't really mm -hmm. believe you. So there will come some point where voters do believe where, you know, the, the government will be backed up against the wall. They'll have to actually cut spending, so-called austerity, uh, in order to stop interest rates from, from, from going parabolic. At that point, voters start realizing it's real. Uh, and that's the moment where you get some, they'll call him a demagogue, but anyway, some commonsensical candidate who rolls in and says, hey, look, let's just default on the whole darn thing. You issue some new debt to cover the widows and the orphans, you know, cover what's in Social Security. You stiff Wall Street. You stiff the Chinese. That would be an extremely, in fact, that would be popular right now. Yeah. But once so-called austerity comes in, that would be overwhelmingly popular. And that's exactly what happened in Greece. So, you know, Japan, I think, in many ways is special. Uh, a lot of its funding is domestic. Uh, Japan also tries very, very... Um, carefully to be a good partner uh, because it's aware that the U.S. guarantees its existence uh, through free military services. So Japan tries to um, be a team player. Uh, not all countries will be. You know, if the U.S. were to come to that, the U.S. doesn't have to be a team player. We, you got this giant military specifically yeah. so you can screw over Chinese investors uh, is, is what that demagogue would correctly say. Yeah, that... That prospect of a hard default, I had never thought about that. But it, if theoretically, I mean, that would probably work best for most of the American people if you don't pay the other nation states that are holding the debt and you don't pay Wall Street, but you do pay, you know, yeah. like the pension funds that have bonds or whatever for like firefighters, policemen, et cetera. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I hadn't heard that before. How can this crisis that's going on in Japan, can that affect the broader economy and cause contagion? That's the big question. Uh, and the short answer is we don't know. We haven't had a default of a country that's that dominant. I'm trying to think the last time we had it. I mean, maybe World War I. Um, well, I suppose World War II. Not even World War II necessarily because, uh, you know, Germany was, was kind of not really on its feet anyway. Uh, and Japan was not significant. So we haven't really seen that in about a century uh, and, you know, of course, during World War I, the U.S. anyway had the gold standard. And so the U.S. was kind of the firewall that stopped the contagion from the sovereign uh, default. So in a modern era, uh, I am not sure exactly how much it would spread. It's worth noting that like fiat has never existed on a world scale. OK, so we, we are literally the guinea pigs. So, <laughs> so we're going to mm -hmm. find out here. Uh, what happens in an unbacked, a worldwide unbacked currency system when, what would that be, the number th four economy goes down, if it goes down? Yeah, I think that's what people really forget about fiat is this is an experiment. It's, it's yep. been 52 years, so like we don't have a lot of history to show us exactly how this is going to play out and it could get ugly. And it's funny because when you talk to people about gold or about Bitcoin, they think that that's risky. And you're like, you, you have no idea, you know, because most people don't look at what goes in the sausage, right? Um, you know, you've got Jerome Powell, you got the bankers, you know, it all looks very solid. It's all made out of granite. Uh, they have no idea how, how, how much of a Ponzi the whole thing is and how fragile it is. It almost went down in 2008 and 2008 was pretty pathetic in the grand scheme. Nothing happened. But mm -hmm. there were a bunch of mortgages where the people weren't as credit worthy as thought. I mean, it's not like, you know, there was there was no world war. There was <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, that was that was pretty embarrassing to almost take down the entire global financial system over that. Yeah. So if point. it's so if the next one is going to be, um, you know, sovereign debt, then I think I think it's looking a lot worse. And, you know, one of the fun things about 2008 is that when the crisis first hit, you had all of these explainers, like in the Wall Street Journal and in Barron's and whatnot. Barron's is, is uh, you know, kind of a popular magazine for Wall Street people. 
Anyway, you had all these explainers that was like, what is a mortgage-backed security and what is a collateralized debt obligation? You know, all these explainers because nobody in the Wall Street world knew what the heck these things were, right? If you ever watch the movie The Big Short and he's he's trying to go and shop these things to the bankers, the bankers are like, I don't know, what, what should we charge them, a dime, a quarter? I mean, literally... They had no idea. They were just pulling the numbers out of their rear because they had no familiarity with these things. So you had this ghost in the machine that nobody on Wall Street even knew what it was, and that crashed the thing. So that's why if we ask today, like, what are the gremlins? Holy moly, right? I mean, nobody freaking knows. You know, there have been so many synthetic risk pro compared to mm -hmm. 2008. They've been on a tear. They they hide risks wherever they can. The entire thing is a, you know, it's a Ponzi that has uh, official wink nudge. Uh, I don't even want to think how many things in there could break. And so I think we look at sovereign debt, but the I think the lesson from 2008 was that something's going to break that nobody is even talking about. And when we do, we're going to get explainers in the Wall Street Journal and Barron's explaining to everybody what just happened. And, you know, because the rest of the system is this, you know, Ponzi, 100 trillion Ponzi thing, you know, sort of balancing on this on this stick, that's what's really going to take the rest of it down. It's not even really going to be the trigger. And that's exactly what happened in 2008, right? A bunch of people lying on their mortgages should not have taken down the global financial system. The problem is that the whole thing is teetering. And so it takes progressively smaller you know, gremlins to knock the whole thing down. Yeah, that makes sense. I and mean, when I think about the very beginning of 2023, before the Silicon Valley banking crisis and all of that, like that, nobody was talking about, you know, bank insolvencies really. So it, it's this right. stuff that people don't even think of that comes out of nowhere when the system's already exactly. so fragile and could push it over. I got That's a question exactly for it. you. And I, I assume this is something you, you have thought about and it's taught in all levels of school is that World War II ended the Great Depression. And to me, that, that makes no sense because you're sending all your working men overseas to fight and you're just right. producing like bullets and, and military equipment. You're not producing wealth like we talked about at the beginning of this episode. Can you talk about you know, what actually did end the Great Depression? Yeah, exactly. So, and, and this is one of the beauties of Austrian is that you can actually analyze the economy, you know, uh, like the way the way it really is, right? The the actual moving parts, and you know, fundamentally, if you were to pay men to dig holes and fill them, that would obviously be a waste of wealth. It'd be a waste of resources. Uh, in the case of war, of course, you are digging bomb craters and filling them in again. So obviously, wars cannot actually make economies strong again. So what happened in World War II? And again, I think the you know partly the difference between GDP and wealth. Uh, I think mostly what happened is that FDR spent about a decade. I mean, he was just chasing down businesses. He hated business. He had a he had pushed the income tax rate up to like ninety percent or ninety two percent or something. Uh, he used to sit there. He would get the tax returns from the IRS, and he would just sit there and giggle about how much money he was taking from all these rich guys uh, from his betters. And the, but then once the war started. At that point, FDR flipped and he said, OK, I, I can't hunt these guys anymore because I need them. Right. So that was uh, Bob Higgs calls it regime uncertainty. Right. That a lot of the I mean, really, what was happening in the 1930s was that companies didn't know which rules were going to change tomorrow. Right. Like imagine if, you know, you're um, I don't know, you're, you're in some industry and the regulator just completely changes the rules day by day. Uh, you're not going to invest. You're not going to build out your capacity. In fact, you might kind of rein things in and sort of mm -hmm. uh, husband your money. Uh, and so FDR was doing that for the better part of a decade. And then once he he finally got the war he wanted, uh, he he stopped. So like he flipped on a dime and he was like, okay, now we got to have the private partner partnership, private public partnerships. Uh, so it went from this sort of hunting businesses to crony capitalism where, you know, now government was doing everything it could. Um, you know, you want to you want to build a where do they build the initial nuclear bomb? I think they did it in like New Jersey. OK, like <laughs> you're not allowed to do that today. Right. You know, I mean, you know, 
any any risk you want, any kind of pollution you want, you know, you want to kill off your workers, you know, have a survival rate of three months on your work site, no problem, uh, because we need you for the arsenal of democracy. So I think that's fundamentally what tied the war uh, to the economy, because, you know, if we look at other episodes uh, in U.S. history, you know, you, you, you can get a GDP jump, but you certainly get a destruction in wealth. And, you know, we're seeing it right now. I mean, the however many trillion we sent to Afghanistan, was it 12 trillion or something? I mean, <laughs> if if that was, you know, 12 trillion dollars worth of uh, growth for the U.S. economy, I don't think anybody saw it. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Another piece of history you've you've written about is the Forgotten Depression. This is something <clears throat> I had never heard of. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's the fascinating era after World War One. And what's interesting is that, so in uh, 1919 uh, and 1929, we actually had um, pretty similar statistics. So you had this uh, economic crash, you had spreading deflation. And in 1929, you know, Hoover and FDR were really, I mean, they had the exact same set of policies. Uh, they both craved government takeover of the economy. Uh, Hoover had cut his teeth in the totalitarian economic management during World War I, um, but, you know, he was out and sort of pining for it by the time the war ended. And so in 1929, you had this massive intervention, and then that turned a sort of run-of-the-mill stock market crash into this horrible depression. What happened instead in 1919 is after the, the economy started to turn down, and part of that had to do with the uh, post-war demobilization, so switching from guns to butter, uh, but what happened is that the president at the time, he was actually relatively interventionist. That was Wilson. He was probably the most interventionist president, uh, in a, maybe since Nixon, or since uh, the other one, um, uh, Lincoln. But what Wilson was sick, and his wife, was, did, she wasn't really confident to engage in massive economic interventions. And so she more or less just like kind of did nothing. And, you know, so that turns out to be the absolute best president that we've ever had was uh, Mrs. Wilson doing nothing. So they actually cut government spending and they actually raised interest rates. And that's fascinating because that's the exact opposite, of course, of what we do in modern recessions, what we've done really in every single recession since FDR did it. Uh, you would think that FDR, you know, like that would have instructed future generations to not yeah. do that. But anyway, we've been copying FDR ever since. Uh, so, right. So they cut spending and they raise interest rates. And the opposite of, you know, what everybody knows how to deal with the recession today. And so Jim Grant wrote a book about this episode called The Forgotten Depression. And what's fun is that both of those activities it turns out, are exactly how to fix a recession. So we know this from economic theory that the government should stay out of the way. But what's fun about that book is that he, he goes through exactly how. And you know, sort of the short version for, um, for anybody who understands Austrian economics or classical uh, economics is that both of those activities, they free up resources to go to new startups and new businesses. Okay, So if you cut government spending then the government is no longer competing with entrepreneurs for steel and manpower to rebuild racist overpasses. Now the entrepreneurs can have that to build factories instead, right? On the other hand, if we look at the interest rates, if you raise interest rates, well, the recession is happening in the first place because you had all this malinvestment because rates were too low, okay? And mm -hmm. so, you know, that all needs to clear out. If you raise rates, you actually accelerate the process. You wipe out all those crappy malinvestments which means that now you have a bunch of workers and a bunch of offices and a bunch of empty factories that are just sitting there super cheap waiting for an entrepreneur to pick them up. And in the 1910s, we didn't have the kind of regulatory state that we have today, this, this almost permissioned economy. And so entrepreneurs could come in and they could hoover all those up with whatever brilliant ideas they had and they could either make money or lose money. So the economy came roaring back. We got a decade of growth called the Roaring Twenties. And then in contrast, of course, when FDR did the opposite of that, when he you know, raised governments, or I, I mean, really it was Hoover and FDR, when they raised government spending and they lowered interest rates, well, we got the exact opposite. So government hogged up a greater share of productive resources, 
Meanwhile, a lifeline was thrown to those crappy malinvestments, basically telling them, keep it up, guys. Stay in business. You can keep hogging resources. You can keep starving the, uh, the new entrants, the entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurs are always at a disadvantage, right? An established company is always going to have better credit at the bank. They're going to have relationships. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, they were starved. Now, that bringing us back to Japan, what's fascinating, I think, there is that you could basically summarize what Japan's done for the past 30 years as they've been running a recession playbook, a modern, mistaken recession playbook. They've been running that for 30 years now, right? So they've been raising government spending and lowering interest rates as if it's a permanent recession. And the end result is that we can see 30 years of zombie economy right now. When you turn to our recession, when that eventually comes, and they are going to do that exact thing, guarantee you they're going to hike uh, spending probably by two to four trillion going by history at this point. Uh, and they're absolutely going to slash rates. And when they do that, we're going to have a zombie recovery, just like we had after 2008, just like, uh, uh, you know, we can say logically, we don't have counterfactuals for every single recession going back to, uh, to 1919, but we can infer that all of those were made worse because, uh, you know, modern economists follow that FDR mantra. Uh, that was, really, it's the Keynesian mantra, yeah. Yeah, that was really well said. Very informative. Do, how do you think about credit and debt on a Bitcoin standard? Do you think, you know, we still get these these short-term debt cycles where malinvestment gets immediately wiped out, but because they can't keep rates low necessarily for extended periods of time, so maybe we don't have these massive booms and busts. Is that sort of how you see it? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we saw similar dynamics with gold. Um, I think that in terms of assessing what a Bitcoin economy would look like, I think broadly speaking, we can just look at uh, the pure gold standard period. So, you know, roughly 1879 uh, is when the U.S. reestablished the gold standard through um, 19, well, really uh, up until 1913 when the Fed was born. You can go to previous eras, of course. Most of human history had a gold standard, but unfortunately, you don't have very good statistics for most of those eras. Um, if you try to go to economic historians, I mean, they have numbers that are like 10x off each other. And uh, at some point, you know, you got to flip a coin. Um, but yeah, I think that that era, 1879, 1913, that for me is really instructive when I sort of imagine what a Bitcoin world is going to look like. And, you know, of course, in that era, we had enormous um, economic growth. We had the kind of economic growth that Singapore has today. Uh, we had just unthinkable levels of innovation. Uh, essentially, it, everything that we now think of as technology today was built in that era, uh, mm -hmm. including computers, electric cars, uh, spaceships, rocket. I mean, all, all of it was built in that period. We are you know, we're, we're, we're almost like medieval peasants sort of uh, stumbling on these Roman discoveries. We invent almost nothing. It's completely embarrassing, uh, despite this sort of modern fetish about how our technology is so incredible. But anyway, so yeah, I think we go back to that era that would suggest higher interest rates in general. You'd probably be looking at four or 5% real. Um, now, of course, you would have almost no inflation or in that era, you actually had deflation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, the nominal rates, uh, you know, could be four or five or even higher. Uh, that means that only good businesses tend to get funded, right? So if your rates are negative, which they have been in the U.S. for better part of 20 years, if your rates are negative, you're essentially just giving free money away, right? And so really crappy businesses can, can get started. <clears throat> if we go back to that era, though, that 1879, 1913 era, on the one hand, a lot fewer businesses got funding. But on the other hand, you saw the results, right? Which were the greatest innovative era by far in yeah. world history, not just US, but world. So what ends up happening is you eliminate, I don't know, 80% of the business loans, but to a rough approximation, they, the ones you eliminate were the bad ones. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of impressive, like, like almost all of it Good riddance. Thank God we didn't spend resources on those things in the first place. So, yeah, I would imagine higher interest rates. If you tell that to most people today, you know, they'll be kind of shocked just because the economy has sort of grown into uh, subsidized interest rates. But, you know, I think uh, if we're sort of imagining what the future would look like after that, it would be the 1870s. We had enormous amounts of growth and enormous amounts of innovation. Yeah, I love that framework because if people heard, you know, the first part of this podcast, we're talking about zombie economies, debt, all this, all these problems mounting up. But 
on the other side of that is potentially a Bitcoin standard. It's the next industrial revolution because prior to the gold standard and industrial revolution, right, they went through the civil war. So, you know, you have to go through those hard times before you can get the strong men to make the good times. Mm -hmm. is, is that a fair assessment of how you view this? I think it is. Uh, so that's the political cycle. The uh, strong men, what is it? Uh, weak men make hard times, you know, so that meme, and that's based on Polybius, which is 230 BC or something. It's a long-standing model. Uh, it has been accurate for roughly 2,500 years, plus however many years before it came to Polybius' attention. Uh, I think, uh, for better or for worse, it's just the permanent state of things. Um, we have to always be vigilant. I think sometimes, once you discover free market economics, it can be sort of discouraging to look at the world out there and realize how imperfect it is. But I think what's important is to remember that we are always, always in that cycle. It will never end uh, for better or for worse. Uh, and so if you look at, you know, where are we in that cycle relative to most of history? I, I like our odds at the moment. Um, you know, I think probably one of the most important technologies for trying to end that cycle. Uh, one is Bitcoin, which, you know, fundamentally... If you look at how the cycle has happened in the past, the sort of revitalization is when they reestablish hard money, gold. But the problem, of course, is that gold has this fundamental vulnerability, which is, ironically enough, it's also why people love it. Uh, gold is physical, right? You can drop it mm -hmm. on your foot. That means you also have to put it somewhere. And you can't just tell people, yeah, I have a currency and it's backed by gold, but my gold is hidden. Okay, you actually have to yeah. tell people where your gold is and they have to be able to verify it. And once, okay, now you're done because now the government can go find it. They can tell you what they think you should do with it. So I think gold has really been um, sort of a fundamental flaw. And that's part of the reason why we keep going through these cycles uh, is gold's fatal flaw. And so, you know, I think Bitcoin has has solved that. And so I think that the next time we do get to the cycle, I think at an absolute minimum, it'll go a heck of a lot slower than it did in the past because the government does not have the ability to control the money. Yeah, I 100% I agree. You said two technologies. One was Bitcoin. What was the other one? Ah, the other one is the internet. Yeah. I think the internet is just absolutely epic. You know, if we try and find the closest parallel, I think it's really going to be um, movable uh, type printing in the 1500s with uh, Gutenberg. You know, so what that did was before, it wasn't really Gutenberg. Gutenberg just brought it from China. China had had it for a while. Uh, but anyway, before Gutenberg, let's say, it was very, very hard to communicate. Okay, so if you wanted to have a peasant revolt, it was very difficult to get your message out. It was very expensive. Uh, once you had movable type, you know, you could print uh, pamphlets, Right. You could very quickly organize uh, political movements. The Reformation with the you know, Protestant uh, Revolution, um, that happened because of cheap Bibles. Right. Previous to that, you had to pay a bunch of monks to hand write your Bible with like gold leaf. And I mean, this was mm -hmm. not accessible to regular people. Right. So what Gutenberg did was really democratize the ability to communicate and to organize. And that was almost immediately converted into, let's just call it people power, uh, and I think the internet in every way is just a, you know, it's Gutenberg squared. Uh, for better or for worse, I think we're going to go through every stage that we did in the Reformation. So not all of them are as pleasant um, as the others. Uh, but I think that out the other end of that, you know, Gutenberg, uh, I think, sort of gave a permanent boost to liberty. If you look at the kinds of rights that people had in the 1200s versus you know, even today with our constrained rights, it, it's just head and shoulders. You can't even compare them. So I think that we're due for another boost to that with the internet. I think that that's part of the reason why I'm so optimistic. You know, people comment sometimes in my videos, I'll be talking about something really horrible and I'll be laughing or whatever. I'll be in a good mood. And I mean, generally <clears throat> I'm in a good mood because I'm certain we're going to win. Uh, you know, every time that we get checked, every time that the elite makes another move, like with this COVID lockdown totalitarianism, I, I know what's on the other side of it. And to be honest, for me, it just means they're, they're accelerating the process. They're taking it one step further. So I know that we're going to win. And fundamentally, the reason is, I think, because of the internet, we can actually talk to the people. We can help them connect the dots. Of course, they're censoring it. They'd be idiots if they didn't censor the internet. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to put everything they can into censoring it. Uh, 
Um, I always assume that I'll be censored. So I take various steps to, uh, you know, but um, I mean, we all have to live with that. And of course, uh, they're going to keep doing that. But if you compare it to anything in the past, like Murray Rothbard talked about how in the 1970s, you could get the entire American libertarian movement in a single living room in New York City. Mm -hmm. And the way that they had to get their message out was by um, taking ads out in like anarchist bookstores. You know, they would like take a little ad and they would, I guess, hope that they didn't realize that they were, you know, crazy right wingers. And, you know, it'd be like send a self-addressed stamped envelope and then they would send you a mimeograph. I mean, that was the state of the movement. And so if we compare to what we have today, even at the height before Elon, even at the height of the censorship, we still got our messages out. We had to be circumspect. You know, we had to use different words and, and be cute about it. But we very much still got our message out. Uh, I mean, a lot of things that were horrific were, were um, silence, such as, you know, um, safety on certain medicines and whatnot. Um, yeah. But compared, compared to the 1970s or compared to the 1200s, we're in very good shape. So that gives me a lot of optimism. And then the other half of that is that when we do get the upper hand, when liberty gets the upper hand again, I think that Bitcoin gives us the potential to lock it in this time or to at least slow that process. So it's not a, you know, a, a 40 year or an 80 year decline, but it's like a 500 year decline that I will absolutely take. Yeah, I love that. I know you got a jet here in a minute. So I want two quick questions before you go. First audience question, where do you get the fun shirts? And second, what does Bitcoin mean to you? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay. The, the easy one first, uh, let's see, I guess some of them on Amazon. I picked up a bunch of them at thrift shops in Amazon. I mean, in, um, in, in Tokyo, I haven't yet hit thrift shops, uh, in the Amazon jungle yet, but yeah, so a bunch of them are, I infer 1990s style Tokyo. Uh, and then if, if any of them are really, really bad, my wife, um, nixes them, but yeah, generally if you look up crazy shirts on Amazon, you got a lot to choose from. I want to get into Hawaiian shirts. Uh, there's a whole mm -hmm. lot of them. They involve things like helicopters. Uh, so I definitely want those. Uh, but I'm, I, I can't find long sleeve ones yet. Okay, so that's the shirt. Uh, other question, what does Bitcoin mean to me? Uh, I, I think of Bitcoin as a superior form of gold. And gold has always been very uh, dear to my heart. It represents honesty. Uh, it, you know, it almost makes me tear up when I think of somebody working hard to earn something and actually getting to keep it. And that, that very simple mechanic is responsible for so much that's good in the world. You know, like why are there countries that are starving to death? And then there's other countries where, um, you know, everybody can live their dreams. That is simply because of that dynamic. Okay. In one place people can do stuff that's useful and keep the proceeds. So, I mean, that's, that's, you know, what motivates me in economics. It's what makes me angry about the crap that they pull on people. Uh, but to me, gold, hard money uh, is, you know, absolutely necessary for that process. Uh, and I do think that Bitcoin finally has the potential to not only be a better version of gold, gold that you can email, gold that's not seizable, uh, but something that could actually end uh, the political cycle once and for all gold that you can email. I'm going to have to steal that and start using it. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here, Peter. I'm excited to listen back to this one. Where can yeah, we send definitely. the audience to learn more about you and see what you're doing? Uh, let's see, Twitter. So I'm very active over there. And thank you, Elon, if you happen to be listening. Uh, so I'm Prof. St. Ange over there. And then also, oh, I have a website, PeterStAnange.com, and that links to all the other crap I do. Awesome. Thank you, Peter. I really appreciate it. Of course, Mitch, it's a pleasure.